Hey everybody, we're glad to see you here at our second lecture room. And our lecture title for today is Unequal Pair, a coffee industry leaders and farmers discuss, discuss their needs and how to align them. And uh, here are our lecturers, excuse me. And I'm glad to see here Sarah, she'll be your main presenter for today. Your applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, what a great um, introduction. So yes, so thanks everybody, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time with so many things going on, uh, lectures and you know, activities to come and actually uh, be with us for the next hour. Uh, the objective of the panel today, as uh, the gentleman briefly uh, spoke about, is to talk about how to align uh, the needs of growers and coffee producers at Origins with other coffee industry leaders. And how can we talk about our needs in a constructive way uh, and align them to be more impactful uh, at Origin? So without further ado, I would like to first introduce our, our panelists here today and then I will let them sort of lead the conversations uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes. And then, of course, we'll leave the, ride, the, the last 15 minutes for Q&A. If, if anybody has questions or wants to challenge what's being said, then uh, feedback and questions are very much welcome. So let me start from the far left. The first uh, panelist is uh, Catherine Lofberg. Uh, she uh, is from a century-old uh, coffee tradition family. She has a family roaster, one of the biggest ones in the Nordic uh, countries. She has recently, the Lofberg was founded in 1906 by her great uh, grandfather. Um, recently she has uh, become the chairperson for the board of Lof Lofberg. Uh, she has uh, been working on uh, foreign establishments, uh, marketing and communications. Uh, more recently she has extensive experience in uh, working with boards. Uh, and recently she has become uh, the chairperson for International Coffee Partners and we'll hear a lot more about ICP, that's the acronym. Next is, is uh, Jorn Severlo uh, with a trading background. Uh, he started, uh, he started uh, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s he moved, uh, he belongs to the Norman uh, Cafe Group. He's been working with the group for a long time. Uh, in the 90s, he was working uh, in, uh, in Guatemala with Sir Tinsa, being the general manager. Later on, moved to Mexico to lead, uh, the, to lead the Exportadora de Café California in Mexico. And then since 2009, he returned to his home country, I believe, Germany. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I guess I didn't ask your nationality, I just assumed you were German. It's German. It's German, okay. Uh, and he's now the managing director or the Norman Cafe Group. Um, so now we have on my left, I have Karina Orellana. She's a young, passionate uh, woman, uh, just like Catherine. Her family has been growing coffee for uh, multiple generations. She obviously supports the family business but she's also working with smallholders producer organizations in her home country of Honduras, specifically Copan. Um, and she is passionate about uh, finding solutions to climate change. She has adopted the coffee and climate approach and she's sort of evangelizing those uh, agronomic best practices for climate, uh, climate change adaptation. And I also found out recently that you are supporting a women's micro enterprise, uh, again to spread the best practices and, and, and train farmers on how to uh, manage climate change and come up with good uh, systems and methods to, to manage climate change. Okay. And last but certainly not least is our Christopher Mujabi from Uganda, uh, also a coffee farmer. Uh, but a very diversified one. He doesn't just grow coffee, he grows mangoes, banana, beans. Um, he's also the chairperson of the Mani Coffee Farmers Cooperative. 
and he's, uh, he's passionate about coffee, just like uh, Karina. Uh, but he's, uh, and I guess his, his big passion in coffee is to work with the youth uh, in his community, uh, making sure that uh, they remain in coffee, finding viable ways uh, to find career paths in coffee farming. So we have a climate change advocate, we have a youth, we have a youth advocate in the audience. Okay, so um, as we start this, oh, I probably should introduce myself. <laughs> okay, so my name is Sara Moraki. Uh, I am the founder of uh, Vuna Origin, Origin Consulting. I have developed a, uh, a relationship with the, with the Nomen Foundation the last year. We've been, uh, we met in a few other conferences. When they approached me to help them moderate the panel, I was really excited. I, I, I thought it was a very unique approach uh, to the discussion, and so I'm happy to be leading the conversation um, and then taking your questions later on. Okay, so without further ado, um, I would like to get uh, started, and I would like to start by trying to define what we mean by uh, farmer, farmer livelihoods, and and I think that uh, perhaps Catherine can, uh, uh, as chairperson of uh, I, ICP Interna International Coffee Partners, uh, the organization is has a very unique uh, pre-competitive model approach, and of course has been carrying out uh, work, especially in the Trifinio and East Africa. Can you tell us a bit about what what the organization does and and how do you define? Sustainable livelihoods. Sorry, you guys are gonna have to share. Yes, yes we can share. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, International Coffee Partners was founded in 2001, and uh, we are we were five to start with five family uh, coffee companies, uh, roasters and one coffee trader, Neumann Group, and we are from different countries and. Uh, Along the way, uh, three more companies joined. So we are now eight of us, all family-owned companies, all private-owned companies. And I think we are a little bit different type of coffee companies working in different markets, different, we are different sizes, but we have uh, something in common when it comes to sustainability and the passion for coffee. Uh, I think we have been working for, with coffee for generations and we have the same values about uh, the human beings behind the, the great cup of coffee at the end that we can consume in our countries, here in our part of the world. But we have a great respect and a great um, uh, passion for this, uh, not only the coffee, the product, but also the human beings actually working very, very hard and, and uh, we have a respect for the job that is done in the, in the origin countries. So that we have in common. Uh, since 2001, we have uh, worked with uh, more than 80,000 coffee farmers. And if you also count the families and also the surroundings and the, the ones that learn from these projects around, there are hundreds of thousands actually uh, in total that are affected in some way. And uh, it's in 12 countries that we have worked with. So we are working in, in the different parts of uh, the coffee world, which is very important because we can also learn from and take learnings from one part to another part. We call it South to South learning. And we can really uh, exchange ideas from example, uh, from, from Tufinho to East Africa or from Africa to Tufinho, for example. So, um, and the livelihoods of the coffee farmers has always been a very much of a focus for us. Uh, that's what's important, really, to, to have a holistic perspective on, uh, on this and, and to see the livelihood at the end is the most important so that the coffee farmers and the families can live a good life in growing coffee. Uh, that's the most important thing. And then it's of course uh, uh, due to several reasons, like higher productivity, higher quality, and uh, more uh, better production system. But also it has to do with gender, it has to do with youth, 
this has to do with the climate, it has to do with many things. So we try to have a holistic perspective and including a lot of topics in order for us to really influence the livelihoods and the future for the coffee farmers. Thank you, Catherine. Your, would you like to uh, build on build on this as one of the members of, of ICP? Where 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 do where do you where do you stand? Yeah, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for also for introducing. Neumann Coffee Group is is a merchant, and uh, the group as such exists 30 years. But some of our companies are really rooting back 80, 90 years. One company even 100 years. So we have been around. And uh, our only product is coffee. We are local and we see really our function balancing out the interests of the producers and on the other side our customers, which is the industry, small and big. And as such, uh, we are also breathing coffee in, we are breathing coffee out. And uh, we must rely really that smallholders, because that's how coffee nowadays is mostly produced by smallholders, can make a decent living in the countryside. One only has to go outside here to see how fascinating coffee is. Different tastes, different products, different origins. Now all this variety will be gone if farmers are leaving the countryside. So that's why we founded uh, together with Lüftbeck and some others ICP. And ICP, that's interesting because it's pre-competitive. It's not that we are sourcing our coffee through ICP projects, none of us is doing, but we are really trying to support farmers in different areas and try to scale up our experiences and hopefully reach an impact. So we will hear from our two producer friends also what the impact has been uh, done. But this has been the ICP approach really, to make livelihood uh, on a farm much more valuable. And that means growing coffee, but not only coffee, as we will hear. Uh, and that also means really getting organized in cooperatives, uh, access to market, more information, cutting out middlemen wherever possible. Obviously, also increase production and uh, improve qualities. Thank you, Jörg. Um, I think as the, the, we we have two producers here, I think it would be great if you two, both Christopher and Karina, can can ground us a little bit and and tell us firsthand what it means to you, because ultimately, you know, you're the one that uh, should should define. Sustainable livelihoods in in the first in the first place. So, Christopher, in, in your experience, when you think of sustainable livelihoods, what 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 does it mean to you and your community? Thank you very much. I'm very happy here, brother and sister, to be with you. I'm Jeff Christopher from Africa, from East Africa, from Uganda, from Michana District, from my sub county, and I am the chairperson of my Port Farmers Cooperative under the umbrella of Uganda Port Farmers Alliance. And I am chairperson, Michiana U.S. Farmer Field School Facilitator and Support Organization. With our port farmers, more especially youth, much as we are dealing also with our people. Our family, our family level, it means the ability of the family to acquire their needs, like medication, education, clothing, nutrition, among others, so that they can live a better life. So we support them so that they can achieve all that. And so, and then they invest, because we want them also to invest. Probably, shortly we can make it like that. Karina, do you want to talk about your, your experience in Honduras? What does it mean to you? Good morning, everybody. Thank you to be here. For me, family livelihood is uh, to be working together like a family every single day at the coffee fields, trying to figure out what's going on, what we can do, because we depend most on the coffee. And beside the coffee farm, we had a family. We had to feed the family to give everything for them. For me, it's that. 
to be working together, trying to figure out what's going on, to give you some food at the table, medicine, and education for everybody at the family, also at the community. And hearing, I'm interested in, in, in your perspective, hearing what, what Catherine and, and Jorn uh, said about how they understand uh, sustainable livelihoods and the work specifically that ICP is doing both in, in your respective countries. Uh, how do, what, what's your response? Uh, how do you feel that ICP is, you know, their approach to sustainability? Are, do, you, do you feel like it's, it's uh, what's your perspective on that? For me, ICP are doing really good job. They are training farmers around the world, but we need more. We need to be doing more things for everybody in every single country who will grow coffee. When you say more, where, where do you think that there is a need that perhaps is not being addressed? Where do you feel like we still have a long way to go? When I say more, it's more projects more skills, more things to, to be done over there to help people. But we are doing really good job, and thank you for all them over there. And we want to, to do more, like a farmers, together with them. Christopher, what about you? Uh, really, CP, uh, ICP is very, very important, because if you say uh, before it came into existence, uh, farmers who were just in a math situation. So when uh, ISP came into it, uh, we managed to achieve a lot. And I think ISP is very, very important as far as farmers are concerned. Because if you try to say to a, a climate, farmers cannot easily identify whether we are under a problem of climate unless after losing crops. Because uh, deforestation is continuing, much as we are demanding from education. So if we are aware and we are informed, we can be at least at a certain level. So I see everywhere, marketing, whatever, it's very, very important. But when you think of the, the challenges, I mean, I, I, you just mentioned uh, climate change. Some of the conversations that we had before, uh, we, talked, uh, we talked about multiple, multiple challenges. Can you give me an example of, of what you think it's, it's apart from climate change, and please feel free to elaborate more on that. What else do you think it's, it's, we need to invest more? Yeah, we have a lot of challenges as far as uh, coffee is concerned. Uh, we have uh, a patient diseases. Uh, if you come to our country, you will find that many farms have been destroyed by uh, coffee, with coffee black pig guala, that insect affects coffee. Then we have wilt. You plant coffee, Three years, it dies off, you upload. You find you have to replant again. It's also a problem. We have a problem of advance. You know, farmers need the money to take their children to school. Coffee takes nine months to, to harvest. That period, you, take, you want to take your children to school. You don't have money. So they need advance. And during harvesting, they need crop finance so that they can harvest, they can I do post servicing handling in a good way. Uh, not only that, you may find that uh, farmers in our area, uh, uh, during post harvesting handling, you find that there are some skills that they need to know about how to handle coffee. Because if you do one math, the whole system will be off. So it's very, very important to, do, to deal with that. Then we have land problem. Many people have been just away of land. A rich man may come and buy the land. You have planted your coffee for 10 years. You will be just out. You find the family is just not coming around. It's a problem. Then you have been talking a lot of problems concerning coffee. There is no coffee insurance. You plant, you are expecting to harvest a lot. Drought comes in, you lose. Imagine you bought money from the bank your property will be taken. So I think very, very important to consider insurance as far as uh, agriculture is concerned, as far as coffee is concerned. It's very, very important. Then uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, raw production. We can't increase production without fertilizer. 
we need to fertilize our garden so that we maximize production. You see, you can be with the same land, but the harvests are different. You find somebody with two acres harvesting 30 bucks. Another person with two acres harvesting 10 bucks. So we need to maximize what we have. So fertilizer is very, very important as far as agriculture of its concern. Then we have also another thing that's we need a dialogue. If, if people have been chased away, there is no dialogue. Nobody can come in and intervene so that people can come together and discuss. Don't chase away these people. You can remain together and work together so that we can go ahead. So with climate, which is very, very important, you see, we need intercropping. In some countries, they don't intercrop. So re remaining on coffee alone, farmers cannot survive. Those are some of the challenges that we have here. Only these? <laughs> yeah. uh, now, thank you, thank you, because I, th I think you, you started to frame the conversation and go a little bit more in, in, in the details. Um, we could say it's, it's, it's quite a list, right? And the challenge is not to feel overwhelmed by the daunting task. Um, if I feel overwhelmed, I'm pretty sure that I, I can't imagine what it must feel in your own shoes. Uh, but we've heard from Uganda. What about, what about Honduras? Can you, can you tell us um, or build on what uh, Christopher just said? I agree with Christopher. We had a climate exchange a lot. It's a new topic. We know it's a new topic, but we had to work hard. With climate change, we had uh, problems. We are losing water. We are losing production. Our quality is getting bad. But we had a lot of things to do. Another problem that we had over there in my country is economic sustainability. From that, coffee farmers cannot be sustainable because we are in a hard situation right now. And it's kind of hard to say the economic is getting people to go away from another country, to look for another better life. And another challenge is uh, gender inequality. Women and men, we are working separate probably. And one more is uh, child labor. Child had to work because our economic is getting and getting bad every single day. That's the one thing I have, but it's a list. Um, thank you. One word that stuck with me is what Christopher mentioned. It's about dialogue. And in, I think that the responsibilities of, 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 of uh, people in, in, in the industry there are, are not farmers and we do not live on, on coffee on coffee farms we don't farm coffee every day so I guess we we do have a responsibility to be able to connect uh, with uh, folks like Christopher and and Karina and be able to to sort of bring our perspective and try to connect what we can do as for example, ICP, but connect with their needs. And it, there is a lot about the dialogue. Uh, we've seen a lot of disconnections between the projects and the beneficiaries. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing challenge in many ways. Um, how do you, how do you uh, as ICP, of course, how do you, how do you guys try to, to address uh, this and, and try to actually do establish an equal basis for, for communications and dialogue? I think it's very important that we don't sit in, like you say, we sit in, in Europe and, and think that we know the best what you need locally. We have, of course, developed over time since 2001 our methods, our methodology, how to work with projects in a better way. And uh, we follow it very, very closely from our side. Uh, I can also say that we, we all companies and, and like us at Loughborough, of course, we travel a lot also to, to have the direct dialogue. But I think it's very important to, uh, like we do in, the, in our projects, that we employ local people that knows, uh, that can have this constant uh, dialogue 
and that knows the local culture, the local challenges. Because even if we have a method that is well developed, I think that we always have to look uh, from the farmer's perspective and the local circumstances. We cannot think that the, right, the one solution that is uh, good uh, for, for Trofino is exactly the same things that we are doing in Uganda. We have to be very local adjustable. And uh, I think the most important part is really to, for us to, to kind of empower, the, try to empower the coffee farmers try to uh, make them, as, uh, uh, as Karina was, uh, was talking about, I mean, it's the financial su sustainability is very important because then, only then, the young people also see a future in continuing with coffee farming. And I think that uh, we can uh, uh, kind of try to influence the coffee farmers to be entrepreneurs and think about the future. And uh, I think it's also very important, like Christopher is saying, with uh, the cooperatives and the dialogue locally so that if we can help to organize the farmers together and they can then try start to communicate and you can wonder why why the neighbors didn't talk beforehand but uh, i think it's the setup and the farmer field schools that we have uh, are working with where you exchange ideas you exchange uh, many Learning, so you can also compare, like you say, uh, why is the production higher on these acres than th these uh, acres? So I think uh, the organization part is very important, but I think also that the most important thing is to really empower the coffee farmers to see, uh, to be more stronger thinking about the future and seeing uh, um, uh, and being, becoming more resilient to uh, outside things happening with prices, this, uh, pests or whatever challenges there are. If I may add, uh, the focus of ICP is, uh, there are several focuses basically, and Christopher mentioned one of them. But uh, coffee and climate, the climate change, that's real. That's not only a newspaper. Only three decades ago, in Central America, for example, a lot of low-grown coffee was grown between 500 and 600 meters, which was prime washed. That is gone because it is getting too hot. And the maximum altitude at that time for coffee was 1,200, 1,300 meters. Nowadays, coffee is grown until 1,600, 700 meters. So the coffee is going uphill, which comes ahead, obviously, with soil erosion, deforestation, and all the problems around that. Another thing is youth. Coffee, next generation, who's going to grow coffee? Coffee farmers are getting older and older. The young people want to immigrate to the cities. Uh, life in the cities is maybe much more attractive. Uh, pests and diseases, we had in Central America a disastrous uh, disease uh, called Roya or uh, leaf rust, which destroyed uh, the livelihood of many, many farmers. So there are a lot of challenges uh, around. And yes, Catherine is right. Price is also nowadays a big, big uh, challenge. Uh, I think we all agree that the prices which we see right now and which are unfortunately beyond our control, let's be serious on that, uh, this is not sustainable. Um, certainly is, it's, the, the sea price is beyond an, an individual company or cooperative uh, control. Um, We've heard from, uh, from, from you guys uh, on behalf of ICP, so it's a non-profit organization. As, as, a, as a, a non-profit, you have a very specific mission. Uh, but, uh, of course, your members uh, are all uh, for-profit uh, companies uh, that have been working in coffee for, for many, many uh, decades. How do you reconcile sort of the, 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 the commercial interests with the, in the, the pre-competitive interest of, of ICP, and how do you also make that, uh, make that connection with, with farmers? Yes, uh, for us and, and many of the, uh, all of us uh, companies, I think uh, as coming back to the values and the uh, concern about you know, 
acting in a sustainable way. Uh, and this is uh, for for Lovebergs, for example, we, we always say this is that we take responsibility from, from bean to cup. I mean, uh, there are many things that we are doing in uh, when we source the coffee, uh, and when we roast the coffee, and we package the coffee in the right uh, material, and we uh, you work with waste, and we you work with energy, etc. And we all companies work with all these different topics. And, and uh, but this initiative and this engagement in the international coffee partners is, of course, uh, even though we don't source the coffee, uh, I mean, the possibility to source is, is of course there, but it's not that we want to uh, get the farmers dependent uh, on, on us and being you know, forced to sell to us. They should sell to the ones that pay the most, of course. Um, and have the needs for, for the coffee beans. But, uh, but I think that uh, it's important as well as for the farmers to have a sustainable financial business, of course. We are businesses, and not an NGO. Uh, so of course, uh, but I think that you can do, and I think also that it's really uh, financially sustainable to really work with sustainability. I mean, we, you can save on resources, you can, you can really reduce costs, but you can also, uh, for the consumers to, nowadays, and I think even more in the future, will be very concerned that the coffee that you drink is also sustainably, uh, sustainably uh, produced. And, but I think that we have a, a very important tasks as a coffee roaster, roasting, selling coffee to, to the consumers. And that is to educate consumers also. Uh, even if we cannot influence the, the, the international stock price on the, on the coffee, but we can, uh, we can educate uh, consumers so that they, uh, kind of, uh, they, they know the value that all the work that is done uh, in the different origin countries and really appreciate that and also then are willing to pay more for the coffee. Uh, so that's very important. Yeah, if I may add, uh, obviously, yes, Norman Coffee Group is a commercial enterprise, uh, but we are looking for, for partnerships. And we know exactly that our business depends that Christopher, Karina, and all their families keep on growing coffee. So that's really a long-term approach. It's not a short-sighted business, and uh, that's what we are looking for. And there has been, on the other side, uh, on the consuming side, a lot of innovation. We just need to go outside and, and have a look at it. So the consumer is really, yeah, following the trends, uh, very open to taste something new. But that all depends, really, that coffee is being grown. And uh, that's where we need to dedicate much more resources um, to make sure that also in the next decades we can enjoy a good cup of whatever it might be. Cold brew, warm. There are so many different kinds of coffee right now. Karina, I want to hear from, from you based on what, what uh, Catherine and, and Jorn said, can you, can you tell us what you think actually works uh, in terms of working together in partnership with, 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 with projects um, and, and trying to figure out the, the next step, what, what really works? Um, and tell us what doesn't also. When we talk about projects, we need more projects sustainable for every single farmer, but we need projects directly to the farmers to help farmers. That's the one thing that we need to be sustainable. Maybe projects in climate change, new ideas, how we can grow coffee in different ways to be sustainable. Projects in social things to help people to, in the families, how to be together working like a company. Because I always say, far is used not the coffee fields. To be a coffee farm is to be a family coffee farm. And we need that. We need that kind of the projects. And also, we need um, economic sustainable projects directly to the farmers. Because we have projects, uh, yes, whatever organization, but some of them is not directly to the farmers. We are not getting too much, 
but I think ACP are doing that. They are doing working together with the farmers, and that's good because we need that for the future. And who is the future? The younger people. We want younger people to work in over there at the coffee fields. We don't want people to go out of our country. We need that kind of people to bring quality coffee for everybody in the world. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. Are you suggesting that when it comes to, uh, let's call it coffee aid, um, there, there is ways when actually the, the, the funding or, or the, 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 the benefits don't trickle down? They kind of, where, where do you think, uh, where does the value stay? You mentioned it doesn't come to the farmers. Where, where does it get stuck? Some projects are different, you know, but like at the beginning we said, we need, you know, people working over there in our countries, people from our countries working in different projects, but really working. Just not to go and fill some paperwork, so maybe to get a signature for everybody. We need to teach people how at the fields. It's not used to have a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, and be talking for a long time. It's really good to talk, but it's really good to do things, do things together, teaching together for everybody. So if I'm hearing you well, you're saying enough with the paper pushers and the PowerPoints. Let's, let's connect with, with the communities. Um, Christopher, do, do you have a similar experience or you've, have you seen the similar problems in Uganda where projects just don't deliver and it's more about sort of self-preservation rather than really trying to make a change? Mm, I think uh, uh, cutting off middlemen is very, very important. And money goes direct to the farmer. That's one way of reducing money going away and goes direct to the beneficiary. Is a one way. Then second way is intercropping. Because if you want to reduce the unit cost of production, you must make sure that you get food from your garden. You can sell some matoke, you sell beans. The unit cost of production reduces. Then you remain with money. Because if you are saying that the market will, cannot be sustainable, how can you sustain the market? By reducing the unit cost of production. We must look for other ways. If you are a, a, a coffee farmer, you can keep, you can do poultry. Because before you go to the garden, you feed them. You come back, you pick eggs. You give them more food. So that you can reduce the unit cost of production. And you can do other activities using money from other sources while you are waiting to harvest coffee. And then another thing is uh, uh, what doesn't work, as you said. You get a flip chart, you sit on a loom, you teach a farmer how to do good agronomic practice. It doesn't work because this is hands-on training. If you are talking 10 by 10, it means you might have to measure. If you are talking about terraces, you have to dig. Everybody has to dig so that those people can understand really what you mean. If you are talking about environment change, you are in a garden, spacing of trees with the coffee, you must do it practically. If you are talking about planting banana within a coffee, 20 by 10 by 10 coffee, 20 by 20 uh, banana, they must do it practically so that people can understand it. Instead of sitting in a room, writing, writing, people will end up not understanding what you are talking about. Then another thing. Much as we are talking about farmers, farmers, without record keeping, nothing can be done. Because a farmer cannot identify whether he's getting profit or he doesn't, we get profit. It's very, very important for people to know how to keep records. Because that's how they can identify where they are, whether they are in business or they are not in business. They can know where, where I have gone long, where I'm, I'm, I'm right. If I'm using a fertilizer, is it expensive? If it's not expensive, can I continue with fertilizer? That, that thing can help. And farmers do not know how to write. They don't know how to keep records. Simple tools must be established. Simple tools where a farmer can understand, write something, something. It's short, simple, but can be easily understand. I think it's also an, another way to go. You, you, you briefly mentioned on sometimes not having information on how profitable 
uh, a coffee farming is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And farmers may keep farming coffee because that's what their parents have done and grandparents and people in the neighborhood. But maybe they, they are they're either selling below cost of productions or barely making baking it through. Um, and it, it, there is lack of information uh, there. There's a lot of conversations about should some farmers just get out of coffee because it's not viable. Um, and how do we reconcile that with interest that, that, that we have first as an industry, but then going down to the, the level of ICP and, 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 and trading companies? How do we reconcile, you know, we say we care about farmer livelihoods, but if keeping livelihoods means getting out of coffee, how do you reconcile that with, with the work? Are we trying to keep farmers uh, coffee, farming coffee because ultimately that's what the industry needs or are we able to sort of put that industry self-preservation self instinct and really look into uh, supporting, giving farmers tools to say, you know, you gotta be profitable because everybody else is profitable. It's, it's, you, we know that uh, the specialty coffee industry is an extremely profitable um, industry, it's just not at origin. So how do we how do we reconcile that and how can we be honest about the role that we play? No, I think that's an interesting question. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about farming more coffee. I think Christopher mentioned it, uh, or uh, Arena. The farm needs to be seen as a family enterprise. And uh, that is, of course, farming coffee because we are all coffee people, but also intercropping. So increase the income for, uh, for family by diversification. I think that is uh, the name of the game right now. To, to strengthen uh, the farmer livelihood not only means more coffee or not even better coffee, but uh, really take a holistic approach to improve, uh, improve conditions on a farm by really getting different productivities out of the same hectare of, of land. Would you agree, Christopher? Or? It's very, very, very good. Because the same as I told you, that you have two acres of land. You can produce matoke, you can produce beans, you can produce coffee within the same piece of land. So you can be well, you can continue to develop, you can enjoy life with your family within the same piece of land. What about you, Karina? What's your feedback? And then we'll hear from... I really agree. At this point, coffee farmers had to, you know, to grow another kind of crops because we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. From coffee, yes, I want to be in coffee. I want my family to be in coffee, but we can grow another kind of crops. Why? To get more incomes. Probably I'm gonna get incomes for food or maybe for my coffee farm, for my coffee fields. But we need to, to, to know that we're going to have two crops. And they need a different kind of agronomic things. We can not grow, you know, like a crazy, putting some different crops in different ways. No, we have to figure out what kind of agronomic practice need. Because every single crop is different. We need to work in that to have a better future coffee line. And another thing is, we don't want to die. But we had to work. Why? We had to work in quality control. Every single farmer had to know what kind of coffee we produce. And that way we can offer to the people who buy your coffee. We cannot think like uh, many years ago, I am growing conventional coffee. No, we can experiment. We had a company over there. My coffee farm is my company, and I can do whatever thing I want, but in the right way. I think it's better to offer a good quality product, I'm going to get more incomes. You wanted to add something, Catherine? No, I think uh, most of it was said, but it's also, uh, I mean, the diversification and, and uh, growing other crops is, of course, very uh, important for the income. But it's also very important for nutrition and uh, uh, getting uh, 
the food, good food on the table for the coffee farmers. So it's both, and it could also, when it's challenging with coffee, it could, you know, uh, balance up because you have something else then to depend on, like was said. So a lot was said already. I will not go. <laughs> so what now? Like we sort of went from this is what livelihoods is. These are the challenges. We've heard from Karina and Catherine, they gave us some very concrete examples of this is how we think that it's gonna work. So what, what's the next steps? Where do we, how do we take this home? I think from this experience, because I am talking for everybody in my country, for every single person over there who is a farmer, I think we need, you know, more long relationship with farmers, people who buy your coffee, people who drink your coffee, people who are in our organization making some project for us. That had to be, because alone we cannot do nothing. If I am alone like a farmer, yeah, I don't have people who are gonna buy my coffee. Or maybe people don't gonna have coffee, you know, to, to buy from the farmers. But I think relationship is the way that, that we have to, to be done. Together, like a team. Doesn't matter if I am in Honduras and my buyer is from Europe, USA, but we are a team together. Everybody is a team. We have to know that right now, we have a hard situation, but we are learning from this hard situation. We cannot say, okay, I, gonna, I don't gonna continue with coffee. We don't, cannot say that. We have to continue by doing better things, new things. We can experiment. It's allowed to experiment in our coffee farm. Christopher, do you want to have the last word before we move on to the short Q&A? Yes. When I go back home, I will first tell them that the, the, the demand for coffee is a value. We need to grow more coffee. But we must intercrop. We must look for other sources of income. We must protect the environment so that we can sustain. That's all. Quite simple, really. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you so, thank you so much uh, for your contribution, especially Christopher and, and, and Karina. I would like to take uh, the last, uh, how much time do we? Time check, okay. Great, so some questions. How does it work? I, I have the microphone, so shall I just, you gonna help me? Okay, that's great, thank you. So raise your hands and let's see. So first question. Yeah, Rodrigo Benedetti from El Salvador, Central America. We used to be a, and my family has a farm since the 1890s, uh, more than 100 years, and uh, we have been uh, experiencing uh, a production uh, we have been losing production. We used to uh, crop about 16,000 uh, bags, 100 pound bags, and now we, we crop less than uh, 1,000. So um, uh, we still have the land. I mean, we, we are a big farmer for El Salvador, but we produce very little. So I think you should think about helping us also. Uh, now the situation of the company is that we're all working in other things, you know, and we are putting money into the farm to be able to continue the, the cropping of the farm, waiting for better prices, but uh, I, I sincerely think that it's uh, coffee growing should not only be for, uh, um, you know, um, giving people the food they need, but I think for growing a little well for them, you know, not only for the, for for keeping them at surviving, you know, but also for growing wealth, like it happens in in, in the rest of the uh, chain. So, um, I th uh, for example, in El Salvador, we pay more than $60 for cropping the, the coffee, and we get paid only by the exporter only $30 with the prices right now. So it's like, you know, losing money on the, on the coffee thing. And what, now what we are looking into is that maybe intercropping would be a good thing, but much better would be that we producers, we start, you know, producing from the coffee and producing our products, you know, like industrializing our own product 
so that we can go ahead on the chain where there is more value and that we can get more, more money from it. So that would be my point and uh, uh, I would like to share that with you and I would like to ask you if you are willing as an ICP to help us, you know, uh, we were uh, farmers and now we are almost getting out of it. So our next generation is not thinking about the farm, it's thinking about selling the farm to go into other businesses. I think uh, to, uh, to start with, I would like to say that we, we, we have the focus since 2001 then when we were starting the project to focus on small scale coffee farming. But then we don't have exactly the definition and it all depends on also uh, where, where uh, you have your farm and what does it look like? Do, is it considered big or small? Or, uh, but we had a, a project for, we have the project uh, in Trifinio, which we, we had for, for many years with successful results. So there are things to do. And I think it's, as you bring up, I think it's very important for, uh, for young people to really see a future in growing coffee because we will have consumers uh, as we talked about and as we can see here uh, really demanding great coffee in the future and really want to, to be able to drink sustainable good tasting coffee in the future so I think that uh, there is potentials for, for really doing efforts to, uh, to increase the production and uh, getting a better livelihood in growing coffee and, see, and getting the young people, the next generation to really see a positive future uh, but um, thank you for your Yeah, for those who are not familiar, Trefinho is just between El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. And you're right, uh, El Salvador is really an example, um, a sad example actually. The crop went down tremendously. It was a country which used to uh, crop 3 million bags, is down now to half a million bags. You had very powerful and large cooperatives and um, somehow yeah, this country was lost for, more or less, lost for coffee production. Which should be a warning signal for, for, for all of us. Sure. And yes, we should, we should help. And I, and I think that I want to highlight a point that you talked about, which is about value creation, right? So it's, we talked a lot about increasing yield, increasing productivity, but I think you're also referring to added value. Uh, we know we are we, we all know that the value of green coffee has pretty much stayed the same while everything else is 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 increasing in value so the point is I think you raised also a good point of, of, of figuring out ways to increase the value and, and not just in the green increasing yield and productivity but what else you know we all know that creating a beautiful uh, cappuccino latte art has tremendous value uh, while the green remains where it is, everything else has increased in value. Sure. Uh, I just uh, in interview in our project, it was actually a group of women who started to, to uh, you, you know, they learned how to first cup the coffee, know, like Karina is saying, know exactly what quality are we really producing, was the, uh, and also then started to roast the coffee and selling it in the, in the local market which was a starting point to really get further on in the value chain, which was a positive example, even if it was quite small. So it's a good idea. Uh, hello, my name is Avia Shenafi. I'm from Ethiopia, from Limbukosa Coffee. I really want to thank you to be present. I also love that they, they, they take up uh, the good practices that we do. We have a better, we could pay a better uh, people who could people who, are, who could do technology. But also there is, we are also a business, there is a limit to which we could go. We could, uh, you know, we could uh, give some seedlings, we could help uh, here and there something, but we cannot take all these things. And so my, my question to you is, is ICP also uh, working with, uh, you know, big farms, middle farms, we, who have really local technology access to help them to you know, get uh, small farmers around them and grow up with them. Do you have that type of uh, projects? Um, 
Well, we try to scale, um, but our direct approach is more towards uh, small farmers and not towards uh, mid-sized or larger farms. Our group has uh, three farms, uh, and around these farms, yeah, we try to to, to group also project work uh, for small holding farmers, but not the other way around. You can also, uh, I mean, we have, of course, uh, we are all in, in uh, ICP sourcing coffee from both uh, small-scale farmers as well as bigger plantations. And there we have the connection and we have the knowledge and we are meeting big uh, farmers, like big plantations. So, of course, we can take that knowledge with us and try to influence into our projects and try to work together even if it's not that set up exactly that you pointed out. So uh, some, some knowledge uh, and some, some work is being done but not exactly that. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's good that we see a lot of questions, uh, but uh, they will kick us out in a little bit. So let's take no more than two questions. Try to go straight to the question uh, so that we can speed it up because we need to make room for others. Um, I saw in, in your brochure, this is a question for ICP, uh, that one of the things you do is access to market. And we haven't really talked about that. Can you explain how you provide access to market for the small producers so that they can hopefully sell higher than the sea price above their cost of production? Yeah, how, how do you get access to market? First of all, that you get to know the quality uh, you produce and how you can improve even uh, the quality. Arena didn't explain, but she is, is doing some testing on honey, coffee, so that's what, what is outside, for example. Getting a premium for the coffee you are producing, and that you can only get if you know exactly what you're producing and what is the demand, uh, what do customers really want. And then pricing, obviously. Uh, cutting out middlemen, uh, give market information. Where is the sea market right now? Where are premiums, differentials for coffees? Um, other coffee and climate, what is going on in the world, how is the world production, how, is cons how are consumption trends, um, weather phenomena uh, in many countries. So there are a lot of possibilities of really getting, getting access to, to market. And then obviously the direct dialogue and, um, and shorten the supply chain really. Bring the farmers to events like this, that they can dialogue with uh, with final customers? Uh, I think the organization of the farmer is also very important here, where they organize themselves in, in the cooperatives, and then we usually have also an organization uh, that all the cooperatives are uh, getting help to really sell the coffee. So it's a structure to reach the market more easily for the individual coffee farms. Really? Yeah, one, one more. One more. Okay. One more. I think Vava over there, she's had her hands up for a long time. Um, thank you. Um, mine is one quick comment about what I've seen happening in developing countries regarding, um, I guess, foundation money and uh, aid money. And oftentimes because producers um, don't have this knowledge, like Christopher mentioned, of calculating their cost of production, you find that every time we have interventions on the ground by be it the USADS or organizations like this, markets are often distorted and then you find that the producers are still left in the same position when that project ends. So I think it's important to find exit strategies. When you talk about empowering these communities, what's the real definition of empowering these communities? And then this this way I'm delving into my question to Catherine regarding, you mentioned that um, you bring these farmers up to a certain level, but they can, they're can they free to sell to the highest speed of whoever comes in and offers a good price. However, as a business, how are you safeguarding your investment in these communities since you're not an NGO? So are you finding maybe ways of getting them forward contracts with certain buyers of your preference or with all the money that you invest in these communities, how do you as a private enterprise safeguard your interest given you're not an NGO? 
Yes, it's not linked directly to our sourcing. We see this more as an investment for the future. I think what's, uh, if we can create a better livelihoods for the fo coffee farmers, they can produce more and better quality and uh, live better lives and see in the future of uh, coffee farming. Of course, that's going to benefit us as well in the coffee industry uh, and for us to be able to sell great coffee also in the future. So that's really our perspective when it comes to this thing. Um, and your first question uh, um, was the exit strategy. And that's something that we have developed uh, over time now. And we are working on really uh, defining from the beginning how this exit strategy should look like. It's, uh, we, I think all the methods has, as I said, developed over time. And I think it's very important, like you say, that the, it doesn't go back to where it started once we leave. But we want to, the development to start and then continue uh, also when we have uh, finished our project. So we want to help the farmers to start the development and then continue afterwards. And it's very important that we cooperate with local organizations, I think, that can take over some of our work that is needed also uh, after the project. Um, but it's, it's a good comment because it's very important. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to get in trouble if I keep taking questions, uh, the organizer will come after me. But I have good news, so ICP is still open for questions. We have ICP implementing um, agent foundation here, it's the Neumann Foundation, which is the implementing actor for, for ICP. They're here to exchange contacts. If you have uh, questions for them, uh, we have Jesco here at the back. Go after him. We have Aaron here. Uh, so you can continue the conversation. Thank you to our panelists for a very great uh, conversation.